I want to uh, start by trying to explain to you what a middle-aged woman, and that's probably being generous, my 35th reunion is coming up this spring, so, uh, but what is a middle-aged woman? What am I doing as special counsel for investigation at the National Football League of all places? The only sport that, as a woman, I couldn't have played, at least when I was growing up. Um, so I I'll tell you how that happened. It all started here. It really did. It started with what I learned here about how to, um, how to approach a legal issue, how to, um, how to learn all about it, how to be objective as you're gathering information, um, how to bring your values, your integrity to everything that you do. And I took that with me when I graduated um, from here. And as you heard, I went to the Manhattan DA's office after graduation. And I turned uh, what was a three-year commitment that I had to make to Robert Morgenthau when I took the job into a three, almost three-decade-long career there. Um, because I just love what I did. It's, it's a great thing to be able to wear a white hat, to be told, as Mr. Morgenthau told us, to you reinvestigate everything that comes in here. You gather all the facts with all the, the resources that you have, and we're going to talk a little bit about the different resources that I have now compared to what I had at a DA's office. But you gather all the information that you can, and then you decide what really happened. And then once you do that, you decide what's the right thing to do. And that's all he ever told us, decade after decade of all the assistants that came in. If you talk to the first years that start in the DA's office um, uh, this summer, they'll tell you the same thing. All they've been taught to do is to do the right thing. So I spent, uh, I, I spent almost 30 years doing the right thing. And then I decided it was time to go into the private sector. Uh, the three kids I have who are around your age are all close in age. They were going to be in college at the same time. The dad had passed away when they were young. So it was my public servant salary that was or was not going to put them through college. Um, and my accountant made it very clear to me it was not going to put them through college. Uh, so I started to look for another job. Uh, and I wanted to use the skills that I had gathered at the DA's office, the investigative skills, the, uh, the value system that I carried forward there that I learned from Mr. Morgenthau and my other mentors in the office. Um, and I had a specialized area. I, um, I was in the sex crimes unit there for 25 of my 28 years in the office. I was a deputy chief for 11 of those years um, uh, to a woman who was chief uh, who actually went to UVA law school 10 years before me, Linda Fairstein, who if any of you like crime novels, when she retired from the DA's office, she writes crime novels now. So I'll give her a plug for her crime novels. Um, but, uh, but I learned a lot um, because we kept people that long. And so it was a wonderful learning experience and you became really expert at doing what you were doing. So I stayed, I, so I started to look for another job um, and I wanted to use all those skills I had and I ended up, I knew a guy who ran a consulting and investigations firm in Manhattan. His uh, name was Robert Tucker and he had a place called T&M Protection Resources. And I convinced him, this was in 2011, that summer, that the private sector needed more people with background and experience in these sensitive issues to handle them, to help them write better and stronger policies, to help them enforce their policies to help them do education and training. We need to do more preventative work in these areas and not always be reacting to bad things that happen. And then, of course, though, when there are allegations that something bad happened, that they needed people who had the expertise to investigate these appropriately to do these investigations. So somehow I convinced uh, this man uh, that he should give me a shot at doing this. And I had an outline of my presentation to him. And I was told afterwards I was supposed to have called it a business plan. But what did I know? You know, I was a public servant my whole life. Um, but somehow I convinced him, and he let me open uh, a division to do that there. And I started that in October of 2011. And soon thereafter, all hell broke loose in this area, uh, really. Um, uh, uh, Penn State broke open. Uh, Syracuse had a similar allegation with an assistant basketball coach. Herman Cain's presidential campaign imploded over allegations of sexual harassment in the workplace. 
all kinds of K through 12 private schools had allegations of things that had happened to their students at the hands of adults uh, back in as far back as the 60s and 70s and 80s. And so now everybody was grappling with what should you do with all those allegations. There was a time uh, when they would not have investigated them and certainly not have investigated them as thoroughly as we are doing now today. And we'll talk more about how we're trying to do that in the private sector when we do the panel. Um, but that's what I started to do there at TNM with schools, with businesses, with, um, with sports teams and leagues. I actually did more work uh, with the NBA than I had done and the WNBA than I had done with the NFL, but I, I had done some limited work. And then we get to 2014 um, and Ray Rice occurred. Is there anybody here who has not seen that video of Ray Rice in the elevator? No, so you know a hand goes up. Um, that changed the world, at least for the, the professional sports world. Um, it showed people what I knew, having been a prosecutor for almost three decades, that when you punch a woman in the face, it is qualitatively different than two guys going at each other in a bar fight. Um, and, and a lot of the world had to see it that visually to understand that. So as the NFL reacted without really understanding the whole nature of domestic violence um, to it, our fans, our sponsors, inside our, our employees, inside the league, our owners, our teams, everybody was almost unanimous in the opinion we didn't do a very good job. And, and I say, we now, I'm there now. I didn't come in until the fall after all this happened. Uh, I owe my job, frankly, uh, to Ray Rice and, and to the, uh, how badly it, uh, the NFL first handled that. And I can say that, and I know we're recording this, and I'm not afraid of losing my job as I say that, um, because if the commissioner of the NFL, if Roger Goodell was standing here, he'd be the first person to tell you that. He has said that again and again. I've seen him do that publicly. We did not handle that well. And one of the reasons they didn't handle it well is because they didn't have the people who understood what domestic violence is. They didn't understand the criminal justice system. And I'll give you an uh, uh, explanation of, of how that um, had its effect there. So Ray Rice in the criminal justice system was arrested for a felony. The case was reduced to a misdemeanor. They sent him to a program, a deferred kind of prosecution program, at the end of which Ray Rice has no criminal record. The NFL at that time, as they watched that all go on, they had like we all had, we saw the outside the elevator tape, which for a lot of us was quite enough to figure out what they should have done. But they didn't have the inside the elevator tape. They had what the criminal justice system did with that case and Ray saying, I hit her. And then she stumbled because she was so drunk. They had a totally different image in their mind of what had gone on in that elevator um, than even I did, but you know, I, I had 30 years of background in this area. Um, and so they, they, uh, they had their reaction and their discipline accordingly, and then of course the inside the elevator tape comes out. And you see what that really looks like, and you see how different that is, and you see that you can't possibly say, we give two games to an assault in a bar fight, and we give two games to that. We just can't do that. Um, so that was partly a result of not having anybody who understood that in the criminal justice system, the fact that you end up with no record doesn't mean something awful did not happen at the beginning. Okay, there are a lot of reasons we enter into deferred prosecution uh, agreements. You know that uh, his victim was his fiance who he married um, while the case was pending. So one can assume that she was not the most cooperative victim in the world and didn't want to see him prosecuted. I'm sure she didn't because that's what she told the commissioner of the NFL, don't do anything to him. Tried to take the blame upon herself as we in this area know that domestic violence victims do. So as a result of that, the NFL hired me as an outside consultant and some other people and said we gotta look at how we handle these things. We have to do a better job. So the biggest thing that we changed, we, we put in a lot of education and training, um, which if that was the panel, what we were gonna be about, I'd talk more about that, but we're here to talk about investigations. So what we did is decide that we were going to do independent investigations of allegations that our personal conduct policy was violated. So let's start with the first question, why do we have such policy? A lot of people want to know, why does this business, and it is a business, okay, um, why does this business uh, care what its employees do on Saturday night when they're not at work? Um, why do they have a right to, to, uh, to tell me what I can and can't do and that my job is affected by how I behave myself when I'm not at work? 
And the answer is because the NFL stands in our culture where it does, rightly or wrongly, whether you like it or you don't. I like to talk reality. Um, and reality is, if an NFL player takes a knee on the sideline, that is huge news, okay? If your professors took a knee at a UVA football game, nobody would write a thing about it, okay? If a, if a, a higher up at, at, the, uh, at IBM took a knee at a football game, nobody cares. You care because it's the NFL. And especially our players and our coaches and our more mainstream, uh, not mainstream, but out front kind of people. Everybody is watching what we do. So that gives us an opportunity, um, I think, to lead. I see it as an opportunity and not a burden. That yes, they have created a policy that, that uh, requires me and, and everybody who gets an NFL paycheck to hold ourselves to a higher standard of behavior 365 days a year, 24 seven. But I see that as an opportunity because then we can lead. And we're talking about a sports business. We're talking about a business where tons and tons of young people Girls and boys watch this game all the time. I know I have, all three of my kids uh, are big, big NFL fans and have been since they were little. So they watch this behavior. And so we have an opportunity to make a positive difference and not a negative difference. So we decided that we were going to do our own independent investigations um, of allegations that this personal conduct policy uh, was violated. And by the way, this is not a new policy. I, I'm not taking any credit for writing what I think is, is a great policy and holding uh, us employees to a higher standard. This policy was put into place in the late 1990s. Okay, it was called a violent crime policy when it was first instituted and its name got changed in the early 2000s to a personal conduct policy. So the National Football League, just like the other uh, major sports leagues, had very long for decades cared what its players and its other employees do for exactly the reasons I just talked about. The difference is that all of us in these sports leagues used to almost 100% defer to the criminal justice system to tell us whether our policy was violated or not. And then we would take whatever information they would give us and the, their outcome and we would decide what was an appropriate way to hold somebody accountable for that. Uh, and what we really learned in Ray Rice is we cannot just look at the outcome in the criminal justice system and have us tell us how we should handle our policy violations. Not just because that we don't get enough facts about exactly what happened, but we don't get enough facts to inform what should our reaction to that be. Okay, our, our, I, I don't want to just talk about discipline because it's not about discipline. It, 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 you're all learning in, in criminal law that when we talk about punishment, it's not just about you know the lash, the retribution aspect. It's about deterrence. It's about specific deterrence. I want this person not to do it again. It's about general deterrence. I'm sending a message to a wider audience about this behavior and how they shouldn't do it. So we're thinking of all those things as well when we decide uh, um, what is the appropriate way to hold somebody accountable? And we weren't getting the information we needed from the private sector, uh, from law enforcement. So we decided we were going to do our own investigations. And, and to me, that made perfect sense. I mean, think about you've all already, I'm sure, worked different kinds of workplaces. Every workplace you ever worked and every workplace you will ever work is going to have various workplace policies. They're going to have a sexual harassment policy and an anti-discrimination policy. They're going to have workplace safety policies. They're going to have all kinds of policies and they all generally come in a very thick handbook that they hand you day one and that oftentimes you never read. Um, but they will have a whole bunch of policies. And if there's an allegation that a policy has been violated, well, your workplace is going to investigate that because it's a workplace policy. Yet we had in our major sports organizations these conduct policies that we let some outside entity, the criminal justice system, tell us how we should handle that. So I think it makes perfect sense what we're doing now to enforce our own conduct uh, policy and do our own investigations. So how do we go about doing these investigations? Well, it's totally different, I can tell you. Not totally, but uh, the biggest difference for me doing these in the private sector now than doing them in uh, where I was in law enforcement was one word, subpoenas. OK, subpoenas. I want to do, I want to bring to this job, um, I want to bring the same thoroughness and objectivity that I did for 28 years at the Manhattan DA's office and three years at the private investigative firm I was at. 
um, I know I can bring the same objectivity. I learned that the day I started here at UVA Law School, and it's something I've taken with me my whole life. But the thoroughness with which I can do my job is affected by the fact that I don't have subpoena power. So that means I can make a list of all the witnesses who I think will have information relevant to this investigation, and then I go and ask them to come talk to me. Okay, I can't do what I used to be able to do. You, I'll see you Tuesday. You, I'll see you Wednesday. You will all come into my office in the next week and I will talk to every one of you. Can't do that now. So we have to ask. And in the area of domestic violence and sexual assault and child abuse and these kind of special victims uh, uh, allegations that I was brought in to investigate and oversee the investigations of, there are a lot of reasons people don't want to cooperate in these kinds of investigations. All the same reasons that they don't want to cooperate with the criminal justice system, and I'd say, and more. Because in addition to anything the criminal justice system can do to them, the League does something different when it holds people accountable. One of the things you heard me say that we can do is suspend somebody, suspend them without pay. So we can affect the amount of money your family is getting. If you've been victimized and you've been physically assaulted by somebody who is the breadwinner for you and your children, um, the last thing you may want is for somebody to take that money away. And so there are lots of thoughts going on in people's heads about should I report and should I continue cooperating in something that I've reported. Understandable. We are sympathetic and empathetic to them. We have to figure out a line um, where we reach out to someone and we reach out to them a second time and maybe a third time, but you've got to figure out your line where you're giving them an opportunity to do something and trying to explain a process that's trying to be helpful, trying to hold someone accountable, and when you're starting to coerce and force somebody to do something, because that's the last thing you want to do to a victim of any of these kinds of crimes. Okay? They need to recover in their own time. So what, one of the things we decided to do because of that is I send an initial letter out when there's been an allegation that this has happened. And I start the investigation with a letter to the alleged victim. And it introduces me and who we are and what we're doing here in the investigation. And then the second paragraph says, if you do not want to cooperate in the investigation now or ever, there are still resources available to you. The NFL will help you with resources. If you don't feel safe, physically safe, then you need to call this person in our security department who, who will talk to you and help you with resources to feel safe. And if you need counseling and your family needs counseling and things of that nature, then you call this other person um, who we have here who has a clinical background um, and will help you do that because we think that's very um, important. So uh, when we do our investigations, that is the first thing we do, reach out for the alleged victim. The second thing we do is reach out for law enforcement, and we'll talk more about it in the panel, is how do we do this independent, really parallel investigation often while law enforcement is doing their investigation, and how do we not step on their toes and get in their way? I think one of the ways that the NFL decided to do that was hire a former prosecutor who used to say to people all the time, if I had that, a lot of schools, you know, all your schools have to do independent investigations, and I had to say to them in rape cases, I understand you're trying to do the right thing, but I can't do anything to my case if I believe somebody has really been raped that is going to hurt my criminal case. That has to be the most important thing, to hold somebody accountable in the criminal justice system if they have raped somebody, if they have engaged in a physical assault of somebody. So I was used to saying, hold off. Not never, but hold off for now. I, I've got to do what's right for my case. So I understand the criminal justice system. And when I call up a police department or a district attorney's office, I can talk their talk. I, I get that. And so a lot of times what I'm saying is, do me a favor if you won't give it to me now, police reports, 911, surveillance video, just get it. Just go out and get it. Um, and that's especially important in the domestic violence area where so many of these crimes uh, that come to our attention are misdemeanor level, you know, considered lower level crimes, where in an office like mine, we probably had 200,000 misdemeanors come through the office in a year. There's only so much attention any one misdemeanor assistant DA. I had like 200 cases at one point by the I would, time I was there six months. Um, there's only so much attention you can pay to any individual case, and so it doesn't become the attention and the thoroughness of the homicide case that you're handling when you have less. 
Um, so I was always saying to him, I understand, you know, I, I understand that system, but I know that at that club there's a surveillance video, or outside that restaurant there's a surveillance video because I sent one of my investigators, and we asked for it, and we were told, sure, just bring us back a subpoena. So we can't get it from them, but please go get it. You know, just just so you have it, or we tell the club if they don't come get it, please just hold on to it for us, because someday maybe they will come get it. Someday maybe uh, there will be some kind of civil action, and uh, and it'll be important. Um, so we do that. So that's to out outreach to the alleged victim, outreach to uh, law enforcement, outreach to private entities, and of course the fourth outreach that we have to engage in um, is to the alleged perpetrator, to the accused person. So if that's somebody represented by a union, our players are all represented by a union, as are our officials. All the rest of us who are employees are not. Um, but to those who are unionized, this outreach would go through their union. And it basically goes to the accused and says, you're on notice that something's been reported to us that we have to look into. Our policy says we have to look into it. We're looking into it. Uh, we'll circle back to you to hear your side of the story at the appropriate time in the investigation. But for now, you need to preserve evidence. We want to put them on notice that you need to preserve evidence. And in today's world, uh, one of the things I specifically always talk about in that letter is digital evidence. Preserve your devices, preserve the evidence that's in them, and don't tell me when I come back around in a couple months and we sit down that you no longer have your iPhone 6, 7, whatever number we're up to, um, because you just upgraded your phone. I put you on notice that if you do that, you better keep the old phone and everything that was inside it. So most of the time in these, when there's a, a, a parallel law enforcement investigation, we pretty much get the hand from everybody. That's what I call it. The victim don't want to talk to you now, maybe never. Um, law enforcement, here's the incident report. That's all you're getting right now with lots of redactions in it. Private entities, not without a subpoena, you're not getting anything. Um, and the accused, now here's something interesting for any of you who've taken employment law, you know this. Um, that in an employment setting, we can make the accused come in and talk to us even with this parallel criminal proceeding going on. Even uh, in the circumstance where if they talk to us, the criminal authorities could subpoena any notes we take, any recording we make of that statement. Um, in police departments, they have to run parallel investigations and they create what they call a Chinese wall. So the people who have done this administrative investigation where you've been forced under penalty of getting fired to make a statement, that statement can't be used against you. So in our proceedings, why we legally could make an employee, a player come in while criminal justice system was still looking at their case or it was pending. Practically speaking, we have never done that. Um, I think that I've had exactly one coach who came in with the criminal case hanging over his head, and that's because he wouldn't stop calling me and begging me to come in. Um, and I want to tell my side of the story, and I want to tell my team my side of the story, and thought that was best for him. And of course, eventually you're going to say yes. Just make sure your counsel knows this is what you're planning to do. But for the most part, we would not put anybody uh, in that position. So we circle back at that point once we've gathered all the other evidence we can, we circle back to the accused, again, if they're uh, represented by union through the union, and then we sit down and we talk to them about what happened and hear their side of the story. This is partly why if you read, why do these things take so you know long? Okay, um, They take a long time because this process takes a long time in an effort to be thorough. This takes a long time. If, if that player, for instance, says to us uh, in their interview, um, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so were also there. Oh, good. Give me their names. Give me their contact info. I'm going to reach out for them. Or, you know, there's other information you didn't have. Or if you went here, you know, we would be wrong not to look into that. So we're going to look into everything to be as thorough as we possibly can. And then I think once we have done an investigation as thorough as we can, then we have to look at everything we gathered objectively. So let me go back one second to the thoroughness, something I wanted to say to you. I got taught to do investigations that you leave no stone unturned. There's anything logically, and I can think of a lot of things. I'm so temperamentally suited to do this job, if you knew me better. I am so anal compulsive. You know, the person who organized all her little toys by kind of toy they were before you could play with them and then had to put them back in those boxes at the end. Um, I got taught to leave no stone unturned, and I leave no stone unturned when we do an investigation. And that's the way I taught the hundreds and hundreds of prosecutors that I trained, law enforcement officers, and investigators in the private 
private sector at the various colleges and universities that I did training for their investigators. I told them to leave no stone unturned and I told them do not make up your mind what happened until every piece of evidence is in. If you make up your mind early on, you do that first interview of the alleged victim, and you say, oh, this definitely happened, or this definitely didn't happen, every piece of evidence you get afterwards, you're gonna shove into that mindset. You're gonna do it unconsciously a lot. I saw detectives do this a lot, you know, and everything gets explained in that mindset. So you have to teach people, you have to keep an open mind right until the very end, the last piece of evidence that comes in. And then you sit back and you look at it. And that's what we do. So then we sit back and look at what we have. And we make a decision at that point, do we have sufficient evidence that our policy has been violated or insufficient evidence? Very much like the criminal justice system. You can tell where I came from. I came up with the, that idea that that's how we should call it uh, when we made a decision. It's guilty or not guilty. There wasn't enough evidence to say somebody was guilty. So that's the decision we make as well. Um, and, and that's... Uh, that becomes the end of the major part of my job because I'm the investigation side. So once we make that decision, we write up a report. The report goes over. At the same time I got hired, a man named Todd Jones got hired as well. He used to be the head of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and before that, U.S. attorney out in Minnesota. Um, and he runs the, con the disciplinary process um, from there on in with seeing the report goes out to the accused and to the union if they're unionized, um, gathering information back. Uh, the accused is allowed to come in for a face-to-face -face meeting to address the report. They're allowed to um, uh, send us something in writing if they want. And then a discussion goes on in the office and eventually recommendations made to Commissioner Goodell on uh, what we think is the right way to hold this person accountable, again, assuming the investigation revealed sufficient evidence. If it didn't, we were done. Um, and then the disciplinary process goes from there. So before I close, the last thing I want to say, because it'll help inform your questions when we sit and do the panel, is, is what is our evidentiary burden, right? You're law students. You want to know what the, what the burden is, okay? The policy calls it sufficient credible evidence. That's the words we used in the policy, that we have to have sufficient credible evidence that there's been a violation to say uh, that we can go ahead and hold somebody accountable. Practically, what that ends up meaning is at least more probable than not. Because if somebody appeals the discipline and we have to uphold it in an appeal hearing, uh, we have to uphold it on the civil standard of more probable than not. So I'm going to stop there um, because I know you have a lot of questions and, and I have other panelists who, uh, who can talk about other aspects of how they do investigations um, in other areas of the sports world. So you'll ask your questions then instead of right now and I appreciate your attention. Thanks.